So every once in a while, you encounter a new and different reading of a well-known text that changes your view of it and your perspective on its strategies and qualities. This is a case with David Penchansky's book, Solomon and the Ant, the Quran in Conversation with the Bible. And in this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible, I have the pleasure of speaking with Professor Penchansky. Uh, the newness of the book is not some radical revisionist idea of the text's origins, but rather its literary qualities. I really encourage you to watch through this episode. I think it's a very special engagement with the Quran from a unique perspective. Thank you so much for being here. Please, friends, I will be very, very grateful if you take a moment to subscribe, hit the bell button, and like this video. Hello, Professor Penchansky. I'm really delighted to have you on Exploring the Quran and the Bible. Thanks for being here. Oh, I appreciate it very much. I'm very excited to talk to you. You have written a really fascinating book. This probably will not be the only time uh, I'll, I'll show it and uh, and praise the book uh, called Solomon and the Ant, the Quran and Bible, sorry, the Quran and Conversation with the Bible. Uh, that will be the heart of our conversation today. And we'll be touching on both sort of method of reading the Quran, especially the biblical material of the Quran. So how does one how does one do that? But then some specific case studies. We'll be speaking about the jinn. Uh, and uh, our viewers may not know that there is a biblical subtext that you describe to jinn or genies. Uh, so we'll get into that. And of course, we have to speak about Solomon and the ant, which is the title. So <laughs> I'll start with a brief uh, bio, and then um, we'll get right into the question of the method in reading Quran and its biblical material. So um, if that's okay, um, yes. I'll go right ahead. Uh, friends, everyone, uh, Professor David Penchansky is Professor Emeritus from the University of St. Thomas, St. Paul, Minnesota, where he taught in the theology department for 29 years. His training is in the Hebrew Bible, and he received a PhD from Vanderbilt University in 1988. He has published books on wisdom literature of the Bible, theodicy, and polytheism, more recently has focused his attention on the Quran, and we've been together at a number of conferences, especially of the International Quranic Studies Association. His latest book, here it is again, as promised, is Solomon and the Ant, the Quran in Conversation with the Bible, and that was published in 2021. It'll be the heart of our chat today. His chapter on the book of Hosea appeared in the Jerome Biblical Commentary for the 21st Century, and he is married to Saudi Arabian artist Hindel Mansour and has two grown children. Okay, was that okay? Anything I should add or? Uh... Whatever comes out later, but that's fine. That's what I gave you. Okay, super. Yeah, terrific. So, David, um, I'd like to start by reading a quotation, which I find really intriguing, sort of window into your method and your style of reading the Quran. This is on uh, in the introduction, Roman numeral, Roman numeral 14 uh, from the introduction. So, um, and you've got a little bit of like gentle criticism of uh, some methods of reading uh, the Quran. So you write, quote, some of my fellow literary critics those who engage in close reading of individual surahs, these are the chapters of the Quran, often succumb to a harmonizing impulse. When they see a rough spot in their passage, a tension or lack of coherence, they find reasons to maintain that if the passage were properly understood, the contradiction or ambiguity would melt away. I contend that the most dynamic parts of these ancient scriptures are located in the spaces between pieces of a text that do not easily fit together. Therefore, my analyses often work against harmony. So maybe we can start there. Uh, what does that mean to analyze the text against harmony? Okay. First, I'll, I'll speak negatively about why a harmonizing impulse is not desirable. Uh, First of all, it comes with a presupposition, a theological presupposition, uh, that the text is unified, that the text makes sense as a whole. And the problem with that is often then we bring our uh, harmonizing impulse to the text, and it's not really respecting the text as it exists. Uh, it, it, the text then becomes, in a sense, a reflection of what you previously believed. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but it can happen. Now, in, in terms of the, the text of the Quran or, or sacred texts in general, uh, there are many gaps. There are many uh, disjunctions or tensions between the parts and sometimes tensions between the text and other texts. That's true with the Bible as well. 
and uh, I think, and, uh, and 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 my efforts with various biblical and Quranic texts, I think, uh, uh, demonstrate this, is that meaning is produced most uh, uh, reliably in these tensions, in these disjunctions, in these dissonances. So when I examine them, when I look closely at them, I think th that's what generates the meaning. And that's what uh, engages the reader in the text because they have to they have to fill it out. I, w I was working with uh, with a class on on the, the Joseph store recently, and and there there's 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 a real disjunction there. For instance, between uh, where where the uh, the the husband declares uh, his his wife guilty of trying to seduce Joseph, and then she holds this banquet, and and we have a whole different and and that's the tension now now. Uh, somebody who wants to say that the whole text is is a is a is a unified product from from a from a single mind and every every part of it has to agree, they're going to try to paper over these kinds of disagreements. And I want to highlight them. I, I, I th that was my method with the Bible, and that was that that's been my method with the Quran as well. Yeah, and it seems as though I mean I could read a bit more from the quotation because, you, but maybe I I'll just ask you since you're here with us. Because I think as you, you continue that thought in the introduction to the book, uh, you, you say this this doesn't mean that the text loses meaning when we find rough spots or disjunctures, um, that actually uh, it's by exploring those dis disjunctures that you find more meaning. So, um, again, you're not trying to, uh, I don't know, make an apologetic reading of the text and just make everything seem unproblematic, but there, there's something productive or fruitful about seeing these disjunctures. Productive is, is is the word I would use. That's very yeah. Meaning is produced in the disjunctures. I I I first developed this idea uh, in my dissertation, which I was working on Job, and there are all kinds of disjunctions in Job. We have you know a, a, a frame narrative uh, that uh, reads kind of like a folk tale or a fairy tale, and then we have this 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 very very technical and erudite debate in the center of the book. Uh, the beginning of the book has has the Satan and the Satan just vanishes in the rest of the book. The portrait of God is different in the different sections of the book. So, and, and I found that, that that that's where the meaning is produced. That's the tension. And I I was I, I wasn't sure if going into the Quran that I would find a, a similar phenomenon. I mean I I guess I, I was subject to the popular notion that the Quran is much more pious and much more uh, uh, doctrinaire, and 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 because it came from a, just a relatively short period of time, much more unified. When I actually started uh, looking at at, at texts, I, I found just the opposite: that the richness and the uh, uh, the the potential for universal universality comes from these tensions, and 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 a, and a text that was totally unified and predictable. Uh, wouldn't have the same kind of impact or or generate the same kind of meaning. That's that's my piece. It's a really it's a really interesting point. I hope uh, people will reflect on that without assuming that this means there's some sort of antagonistic approach to the text. Uh, on the contrary, um, this is a serious literary engagement with the text, and it can be, I, I think, a really fruitful way of understanding scripture. Uh, I'd like to uh, go on to the jinn now, which may be an example. Um, of finding uh, tension within the text. Uh, so um, you you discuss the jinn in conversation with certain biblical texts. And uh, I mean, maybe we should just start there. You speak of the Bene Ha'olahim, um, the sons of God. Uh, I mean, um, I should probably ask you a more pointed question, but maybe just as, as background, um, you know, what can a knowledge of the Bible contribute to our understanding of the jinn or the genies in the Quran? Well, first, I should say that that, that that my approach is to first pick a text of the Quran that's interesting to me mm -hmm. and, uh, and immerse myself in it. And because of my uh, previous background in the Hebrew Bible, uh, texts from the Hebrew Bible will will, will occur to me. And I, I'll, I'll bring them in uh, to, to help me understand. Now, in, in terms of the Jin Surah, uh, there, there was a, a, a very a large lacuna in, in the text that, 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 that just disturbs the reader or should disturb the reader. And, and that's that the, the Jin are reporting that uh, 
uh, that they used to have access uh, to the to the the, the councils of heaven. They uh, they were, they had there were there were seating places for them in heaven. And then all of a sudden, uh, they're not allowed in heaven anymore. And every time every time they try to gain access to heaven, uh, they're faced with these fiery meteors and these uh, uh, strong uh, guards that are keeping them out of. So, what happened? Uh, why did the jinn lose access to heaven? That's seems to be a central question of the text, and right. it's one right. that the text never answers. So the traditional interpretations say, uh, well, when uh, when when the revelation of the Quran came to humanity, uh, there was no longer any need or desire for there be to some other access to divine information, so the door was shut. Now, the, the other way that the interpretation comes and and the, I, I didn't I didn't see that the commentators were really adequately dividing these two and they're really different is that the jinn were never allowed in heaven mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. always came in heaven mm -hmm. in a dishonest manner and uh, so uh, perhaps god was not uh, paying a careful enough attention and then it, it came to his attention both of those solutions are external to the text they just mm -hmm. they're just not there the text doesn't say anything. So in this case, uh, looking at other situations in the Hebrew Bible where uh, where where supernatural divine beings or liminal beings uh, or even prophets in one case have access to heaven right. or are denied access to heaven. Well, I saw those as parallels yes. that might give me some information about this 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 glaring. Uh, lack within the the, the, the storage. I, I thought I'd just read a bit, just to uh, further illuminate this 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 lacuna or this uh, this uh, absent explanation in Surah Tajin. First, just to remind everyone, Surah Tajin is Surah or chapter seventy-two of the Quran, and as you note in the book, it's not the only place where jinn appear or are discussed or where these particular motifs about the jinn mm -hmm. being excluded from the heavenly council appear in the Quran. Uh, but it's where you focus your study. And I'll just read here, this is uh, Quran 72, sort of the jinn, verse 9. Uh, this is a translation of Qara'i, uh, who says, we used, this is the, the jinn now speaking, we used to sit in its positions to eavesdrop but anyone listening now finds a flame waiting for him. So it's there where the tension is. They they give this explanation that something has happened, but they don't say what and they don't say when. But the translation eavesdrop is not in the text. Hmm. Eavesdrop hmm. is in another text. It just says they had seating places. Yes. And so the, the in, this is just the example of the harmonizing uh, tendency that I that I protest is that yes. is yes. that the translator imported this eavesdropping idea literally. Uh, stealing a hearing, which one sees in another text, but does not see in this text. Yes, I think it's meqa'ad uh, lissema. Uh, so uh, stations or places to sit for listening. But eavesdropping yeah. is more than that in English, of course. Eavesdropping yeah. has a pejorative meaning. Yes, yes, yes. Good, there's really no good pejorative meaning in there. The the the, the, the jinn are, are, are fondly reminiscing about their previous access to heaven, which they no longer have. Yes, yes. O okay, so moving on to some of the biblical uh, examples which provide a subtext for this. You mentioned, uh, I think you said liminal beings. Was that right? Yeah. Is that the word you use? So you, you, you have is. allusions to, I mean, I should just let you explain further, but you, you refer in part to the, the Genesis, the pre-flood uh, antediluvian uh, stories yeah, of Genesis. Genesis, but also some other things from the prophets. So could you explain who are these liminal beings and uh, how do they shed light a bit on the situation of the jinn in the Quran? Well, the, the liminal beings in, uh, in, in Genesis 6 are, are, are clearly some kind of angelic force, I suppose. They're just called, as you said, B'nai Elohim. And um, uh, the, re the reason they're significant is because we, we have a, a case where they uh, violate, and this, this is what's missing from the Quran, is what did the jinn do that was so bad that it got them driven out of heaven, a right. place that they, they seem to belong earlier. So I'm looking at these places where other beings are punished or driven out of heaven. So uh, we, we have uh, Genesis 6 where the... Uh, uh, the sons of God have have sexual relations with the daughters of men, which seems to be kind of a, a 
violating a barrier between the divine and the human. And as a result of this, it destabilizes in some sense uh, the, the, the world. And so chaos is introduced and God destroys the world with a flood. You go even earlier and you have uh, Adam and Eve kicked out of the Garden of Eden and uh, they're prevented from going into the garden by a flaming sword and a, 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 a fiery angel. And then uh, you can go to uh, uh, these two really interesting songs, Psalm 58 and Psalm 82, which both speak, uh, first of all, about uh, Yahweh, the Israelite God, uh, being part of a council of divine beings. Uh, and then uh, some of the divine beings violate uh, some kind of protocol. Uh, they, they rule unjustly, and Yahweh kicks them out of the divine council and condemns them to mortality. That's Psalm 58 and Psalm 82. And the most interesting one, thing I think, is 1 Kings 22, uh, Micaiah ben Imla, uh, because he uh, reports to these two kings who want a divine message that he, he tells them the story of how he went up into the heavenly court and observed a debate that's yes. taking place with yes. Yahweh as the chairman of the board and these other figures uh, that are called the hosts of heaven in one place and other places, one of them is called the spirit. And, and Yahweh says, this is what I want to do. And then various people come up, various of these spirits come up with suggestions. And then Yahweh picks one of them and says, go do it. And they plan on the operation. And Micaiah is observing this. He's in a he's in a listening place, which is exactly what the jinn are. So I, I see these 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 different events as somehow shedding light on the on the Quranic account and answering the question of what's missing. And what's missing is a war in heaven. What's mm -hmm. missing is an active rebellion by figures that used to, in Arab uh, cultural uh, memory, be be worshipped as gods and be uh, be approached for intercession. And and now they're 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 denied that access and they're they're robbed of their power. So I see these other incidences of a war in heaven, which brings us to uh, um, Isaiah 14 and, and Ezekiel 28, where both of these prophets at very different time periods are condemning a particular king, but they're using this these this mythological language of a war in heaven to describe it. So those are the passages where which describe how. Uh, uh, Lucifer, which uh, you know, light bearer, is is cast out of heaven, uh, and and that's used to, to just describe the fate of the king. And even in the New Testament, Jesus, in a very cryptic saying, says, you know, I I saw Satan cast out of heaven like a star falling from the sky. <laughs> just no expansion, but there it is. So this seems to be something that's really embedded in the memory in that period, and uh, it comes out in the Jin story. And there's only there, there are a few hints of it in the in in the in the surah itself, but I only noticed them because I brought the biblical accounts in to to, to uh, dialogue with them, and, and they are uh, well. The most obvious one is at the very end of the of the incident. The, the surah goes on after that, where it talks about all of these uh, all of these beings crowding around the prophet and almost smothering him, and it, it's it's unclear what's going on, uh, but in the context of the surah. It seems to me what's going on is the, is the jinn are surrounding him and threatening him. And this is verse, becomes, verse 19, right? Yes. 72, 19, yes. And that Sorry. becomes a, kind of a, a, a mythological explanation of the jinn being cast out of heaven. And then there's there's other things about the jinn trying to escape. And of course, the uh, the uh, the subjugation of the jinn at the very beginning when they hear they hear the Quran being read and they uh, and they submit. But anyway, that's how the biblical account uh, seems to illuminate some of the the what I would call well missing pieces gets people you know nervous. But the the, the gaps, which I think are the important features of the text. I mean, at a serious risk of self promotion, it it, it does seem to be close to some of the ideas uh, I've argued for about the Quran. I mean, it, the subtitle of your book is uh, The Quran in Conversation with the Bible. And, you know, I've similarly argued that the Quran, in order to articulate, <laughs> Astaghfirullah, uh, in order to articulate its argument, very often it counts on the biblical knowledge of its audience. And so it, it uh, maybe not thoughtfully, but 
it's able to leave things unstated. Um, but can I uh, just ask for a bit more on on your take of seventy two nineteen uh, in Droge's translation, which you quote, in that when the servant of God stood calling on him, that's him with a capital H, so God, uh, they were almost upon him with a lowercase h, uh, so the servant of God in hordes. Uh, that that translation might be close to the way you take that verse, because if I'm not mistaken, you you see a sort of uh, uh, antagonism or threat upon the prophet with the jinn sort of surrounding him. Is that right? Yes. Talk more about it. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, you mentioned that my wife is Saudi, and uh, and she gave me some insight into that word. That in in in, in modern Arabic, it's used sometimes for the uh, the the curls of wool or or or, or like a cloud, so it's, it's it's kind of an encroaching thing, and uh, uh, so there, there there's a threat involved. Now the first thing you have to uh, in order to interpret it this way, you have to decide that the servant of God is in fact uh, mentioning the, the prophet, and I think I think that's fairly certain because you know the beginning they hear they hear they hear the they hear the Quran, and then this seems like the, now it's the prophet who's chanting the Quran. Mm -hmm. Some some interpreters say that it just means believers in general, but I I, I don't I don't buy that. And uh, and so it's it's a threatening thing. So it it's it's the closest they get uh, to this picture of of a of a, of a divine hostility, uh, a war between the the the, the jinn and the, the old religion, you might say, and and. And and the prophet uh, representing the new religion, and and where where I go with this is uh, is that uh, the jinn are kind of an embarrassment to Islam because they're like these independent spirit beings, but it's it's so deeply embedded in the Arabic consciousness. I mean, I you know I, I have in laws who just talk to jinn, and and uh, but so in order to uh, not eliminate one thing they could just they could just have said that the jinn don't exist they're yes they're, they're figments of imagination but they don't go in that they don't that's not how they go in this particular passage instead they just uh, they deracinate the jinn they 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 take away all their power they make them in a sense meaningless you can't you know if, if, if you if you come to them for intercession they're just going to confuse you because they don't have any more access they don't know anything more than you do and the jinn become Muslim just like humans become Muslim. They're, so they're 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 taken off the playing field, so to see. They're they're no longer a threat to Tahwi, to, to the to Islamic monotheism. And and that's where I end up in the story is that that's the effort they're making. It's just a completely uh just uh, take them off the field. They're not significant. We're not going to say they don't they don't exist because that it's so deeply embedded, but but they're not significant any longer. Great. Yeah, this is, I mean, the the way in which you uh, can imagine uh, the Quran uh, engaging with and str almost str struggling with uh, the presence of the jinn in Arabian um, uh, visions, cosmological visions, and uh, coming up with a strategy to deal with that is really, really intriguing. Uh, I have some more questions, but I think we need to move on. And so um, I'd like to ask you about the uh, the narrative which makes the title of your book, Solomon and the Ant. Why did you choose that for the title of the book, by the way? I, I have a lot of trouble with titles. <laughs> I just do. And uh, I struggle with them. And usually what I do is I sit down and write as many as I could think of, even really dumb ones. And I didn't come up with a friend of mine came up with it. And I, I who had been reading my work as I, as he went along. Uh, not in the field, but uh, interested. And uh, uh, I didn't like it at first because it only described one chapter. Right. Uh, but he convinced me, first of all, that that's okay. He, he gave me an example of a book of poetry called Pissing in the Snow, where that just reflects one poem. And yet it was a really intriguing title. And I thought it was an intriguing title. And uh, uh, so I went along with it. But, but I didn't think of it. My friend thought of it. And I, I, I love it now. Well, it does uh, show the um, dramatic presentation of the powerful king and the tiny ant, which is sort of at the heart of the narrative uh, in Soda 27. 
Uh, so, I mean, um, yeah, and you compare the way that the Quran speaks of uh, Solomon and his armies towards the beginning of the anecdote there with something from the Bible, Song of Songs, is it? Is it a Song of Songs where Solomon is presented like, no? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't, that's kind of a minor point, but yeah, you're right, because the, the Song yeah. of Songs describes the king marching with his armies, with banners flowing, and I saw it like a similar image in the, in the surah. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah, because Solomon, I mean, there's different anecdotes about him in the Hebrew Bible, but uh, the Quran picks up on Solomon you know, uh, there's allusions to his horses and his, uh, and and obviously to his kingly power, dominion over uh, spirits and humans. So uh, it picks up on that more, uh, which I think you find in Jewish you... traditions as well. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about um, about the ant? How does the story go in sort of uh, twenty seven? Um, yeah. Maybe yes, you sure. introduce us well, briefly to what happens. Well, one more thing about the title is I do think that this particular chapter is the centerpiece of the book. It, it, mm. a, a lot of the things that I'm working on really, really come to a head in this book. So the, the, the story is made up of three different parts, related parts. The first one having to do with the ant, the second one having to do with this bird, and the third one having to do with the Queen of Sheba. And my rule for this book was mostly to pick passages that don't have anything to overlap with the Bible, because I think other people have done that much better than me. Uh, yourself included. Uh, but uh, I, I broke it down here because I was really fascinated with the story of the ant. And the story is, as you said, is that uh, uh, Solomon is marching with his armies and it's made up of humans and, uh, and birds and jinn. They're all marching together. And in their path is, is an ant colony. And the ant, one of the ants just, just sticks her little head up and says, you know, oh no, this, this terrible army is coming run for your lives or you're going to be trampled to death. Now, we're told that Solomon uh, Solomon understands the language of animals, birds. So he hears this ant and he understands what the ant says and he laughs. And I think uh, the interpretation of this laugh has everything to do with the way you're going to interpret the surah. Hmm. And the traditional interpretation of the laugh, and I give an extended quote from a pious commentary is is that he laughs with a kind of warm-hearted affection for these four helpless creatures, and of course he stops his uh, his army in, in place and doesn't trample it. None of that, of course, is in the Quran. Uh, I uh, I conclude that it's 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 a mocking laugh. It's 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 a it's a laugh of condescension, and my reason for concluding that. Because that's another gap, because we never really find out what happened to the mm -hmm. end. That's mm -hmm. the end of the part of the story. So the reason I conclude that is because Solomon is an insufferable ass all the way through the story. And that's that's not me imposing on the story. He, he brags, he's full of himself, he has a temper. And that's what brings us to the, the, the second part of the story, uh, where he assembles his army. We've forgotten about the ant at this point. He assembles his army uh, in formation, and one of his birds is missing. Right, he, he right. He misses a bird. It's it's right. uh, it's called in, in Arabic hood hood. Uh, the English version is hopo. It's a it's a bird that's common in the region, and the bird is missing, and he freaks out. He's furious, <laughs> and he starts saying all the things he's going to do to this bird when he finds it. And that, again, that just gives us a hint about Solomon's character as depicted in the story. Uh, so anyway, the bird shows up and the reason he was gone was he was in reconnaissance and he, he discovered this uh, uh, this nation uh, that's uh, they're, they're sun worshippers and they're ruled by a woman. And I, I'm not sure which thing upset him most, whether it was sun worshippers or whether they had a woman over them. And Solomon is is, is furious and he, he, he sends a letter to this woman and he says, you have to submit now we're in this we're in the third part now which is the interaction between solomon and the queen of sheba and this is the part of course that overlaps the bible so he sends her a letter and he tells her to submit and she does everything she can to placate this yes this furious and unstable king uh you know she sends him gifts uh nothing works so finally uh she's summoned and uh and she shows up and uh and he he 
he subjects her to a series of tests. And the final test, she fails. He, he, he creates this illusion of there being a vast uh, 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 lake in front of in front of the palace, and she she uncovers her feet, humiliates herself in that way, and it's really just a glass surface. Ha ha! I fooled you. And her reaction is, is which seems a little bit uh, disproportionate. Uh, she she completely submits. She submits to God with Solomon. That's that's the story. Um, my uh, the way where I went with the story is is associating Solomon with God. Uh, this is, and I've worked a lot with uh, the Hebrew Bible with theodicy, and uh, and as, as as you mentioned in another uh, episode of, of of the podcast, uh, uh, the Hebrew Bible is is very free with criticizing God and questioning God. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I I did a lot of work on Job and Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, and 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 the passage where Abraham says, uh, "Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right?" So that's pretty common in in the Hebrew Bible, and it's common in, in Jewish tradition. Uh, the, uh, the 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 midrash connected with the Book of Lamentations has some references to God that would really curl your hair. They're they're, they're so blunt and and harsh. Uh, the Quran is is much more tender hearted about that than, than the Hebrew Bible is. They're very very in in, in my limited understanding here. They they seem very very skittish about challenging God and, and when when a, when a biblical figure in, in the most tentative ways challenges God like when when Noah says you know about the death of his son you know, that was my son uh you know they immediately back up and repent it, it happens over and over again uh so how how do they deal with the very very real issue of theodicy which is a problem for all monotheistic religions if if God is the only true power in the world uh then how can we account for the but for the for the suffering of the innocents, how, how can we account for all the bad things that happen? Uh, Islam has to address that. Now, the, the pious way to address that is to, is what Job's friends did. That you know everything that happens is deserved. If you're good, you'll be rewarded, and if you're bad, well, you'll be punished. And if if it seems like it's not going like that if, if right now, well, it'll it'll work out later in the future. Just, just hang on. Just hang on. Just hang on. Uh, I don't see that as an adequate uh, answer at all. Uh, and I and I, I think that the more mature religious texts that address this, uh, they don't go in that direction. There's a there's a, a psalm that says, uh, "I was young, and now I was old, and now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor is seen begging bread. I have never seen the righteous forsaken." My 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 professor James Crenshaw calls that the song of the blind, uh, and that that is a religious response to the problem of evil. But I think it's a particularly stupid one uh i think i think uh passages like uh, like uh, solomon and the uh, like this passage about solomon and queen of sheba has a much more mature and, and interesting way to approach it so the first thing you gotta understand is that when they're talking about solomon uh they're they're they're, they're in an indirect way talking about god why do i think that because solomon writes to the queen and and, and, and he says submit uh, which is which is you know a form of the word Islam, uh, and then uh, uh, when he in the the letter is called a kitab, which is uh, which is also the word uh, that's frequently used for the Quran. Right. Uh, and, and in he inter- he begins the letter with the Bismillah, in the name of the God, the compassion, the, and just, just like every surah begins that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then uh, um, I guess those are the main reasons. So. I, I think that the author is processing the problem of evil, but using Solomon is because he, because they they don't want to say it directly about God. So there's like a a, a mixture of identity. Mm-hmm. So that that Solomon was 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 a difficult person uh, is, is is a way for them to process that sometimes it really feels in our lives that that, that God is being difficult. So that finally brings me back to the ant and why I see this as a kind of a okay. sentence of the book. Okay. Is the ant is 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 standing in the way of this uh, this 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 on 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 rushing force mm-hmm. that doesn't even know that the ant exists, and the ant is 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 protesting. The ant is saying, you know, run for your life, or Solomon will, will trample us, and you won't. He won't even know you're here. 
and, and I'm saying that, that that is frequently the human experience, that 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 things are, are rushing upon you to destroy you and you have no control and they don't even really know that you exist. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just the, 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 the wars, the persecutions, the, the mass shootings. Uh, and, and, and so I think that we as the reader are meant to identify with the ant. We as the reader are meant to identify with the, with the hood, hood as well. Both, both, you know, weaker subsidiary figures that are being uh, torn apart by, by, by more powerful forces that don't really care about that. And, and so identify with the Queen of Sheba. Would you add that? Yes, I, good, good point. Yes, I would. And, and, and in each case, and they're, they're very different from each one, but in each case, it's uh, the, the irrational force of Solomon, which I'd say in some sense represents God, uh, uh, impinging on them and, and different ways they have to react. So again, I, I see a tension between, I mean, I'm only really saying one side of the tension here, but, but, but Solomon is regarded as a, as a, as a prophet, as a, as a holy man in, 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 in Islamic understanding and Quranic understanding. So we have that reading on, on the surface, and then we have this other one under the surface because the sympathy uh, uh, the sympathy goes with the, the with the downtrodden more than this figure who I think is deliberate you know deliberately portrayed in a really negative fashion and that, that's where I would differ from traditional interpretation because uh, again the harmonizing influence uh, other passages in the Quran about Solomon make him into this you know just, uh, admired holy supernatural figure and, and to hear that, that goes against that so they they harmonize it and so everything that solomon does is thought to be right and everything that solomon says is thought to be pious and religious instead of as i see it as overbearing and bullying so that's why i identify with the ant and not with solomon it's a really intriguing reading and uh i, I mean i hope that um listeners and viewers will will turn to sort of 27 you know the, the sort of the heart of the story uh beginning in verse 17 more or less and just reflect on your reading and uh, and as you read it uh, go ahead and, and read together with uh with david's david's um study of it um his pious, one more thing his pious yeah. just to build on what you said his pious pronouncements at the beginning of the narrative where he's thanking god but he's thanking God that he's better than everybody else. Yes. yes. And then when yes. when when the Queen of Sheba gives him gifts, he doesn't accept the gifts because he's insulted that she thinks that he's not wealthy enough that he would actually need something that she could give him. He's ungracious. He's 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 boastful. It reminded me, and I think I might have mentioned this in the book. I don't recall uh, of the uh, of the the Pharisee praying in Jesus' story that he prays. Mm -hmm. He's praying, he's pious, but he's saying, I'm, I thank you that, that I'm not like this miserable sinner who's next to me. And, and Jesus says that he doesn't go away justified. And that's, I think, the portrayal of Solomon. Yeah. So verse, verse 36, when he, and I believe that's a messenger, an envoy from the Queen of Sheba to Solomon bearing the gift. So when he came to Solomon, he said, that is Solomon said, are you aiding me with wealth? What God has given me is better than what he has given you. So, yeah, he does seem confident there. Uh, ju just, we should maybe move on, but uh, I, I want to mention two things. One, which you really emphasize eloquently in the book, is that many readings in exegesis of the ant, the specifically the ant episode, uh, I think you mentioned this in our chat, but just to underline it, many, many readings insist that... Uh, that Solomon did not crush the ants, that he stopped his army. And, and you even quote a very nice example of that sort of very friendly interpretation of Solomon. Uh, and I mean, I think it's a prime example of what you call the, the har harmonizing tendency. Um, but, you know, as you said, uh, in verse uh, 20 and 21, where Solomon seems pretty, pretty tough with the, with the, with the hudhud bird, suggests that he's not one to have compassion on animals so that that's one thing i'm just sort of uh, paraphrasing what, what, what you said more eloquently but then an, another um, a really powerful line which i and i would like to get your feedback on this is when the queen of sheba 
Uh, she says in verse 34, indeed, when kings enter a town, they devastate it and reduce the mightiest of its people to the most abased. Now, it's I mean, who can know what the Quran's author was intending exactly? But nevertheless, it, there there is that verse. It's there. And it's a fascinating verse because it's it, 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 one sense is that it's fundamentally true. This is what kings do. They abuse power. Human history teaches us this. Uh, and this they, is exactly almost word for word what Solomon does a few verses later. He does exactly the things that she mm -hmm. says. Mm -hmm. And one more thing about that verse uh, is uh, the, the, uh, the royal family in Saudi Arabia has forbidden that verse to be read in the mosques, mm -hmm. according to my wife anyway. Mm -hmm. So we, here we have a text which is quoting the person who at least the traditional reading would present as the unbelieving, initially unbelieving nemesis. Uh, but she is the, the spokeswoman or the mouthpiece of this like, fundamentally almost uh, uh, piercing uh, statement of, of, of truth and social criticism. Um, it, so, I mean, it's just, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Solomon is saying things which, uh, yeah, don't, don't have the same sort of touching, moving, even truthful uh, dimension to them. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is the brilliance of of your reading that it shows us that the Quran is a complicated text and not to be taken lightly. Uh, I think at some point you said, well, some people might assume the Quran is just doctrinaire and pious and there might be elements of it that appear that way. But here we see a, re a real richness or multi-layered element to the text. And it's a um, feature, not a bug. <laughs> that's that's the strength of the Quran, not a weakness. My opinion. And by bug, you're not referring to the ant. You mean like a bug that should be right. removed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I'd like to ask about one more. We probably do this pretty pretty quickly sure. uh, because I'd like to also speak about your journey from biblical studies to Quranic studies. But um, you speak also about Abu Lahab uh, in uh, I think it's Surah Al Masad. Uh, so now one of the short short surahs, and uh, this is also. Uh, um, uh, in some ways connected to the problems um, in uh, the uh, the ant story in Surat al mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so if we could just speak about this briefly, I'm going to go ahead and read the translation of the whole Surah since it's only five verses. And then maybe you can tell us why you chose. I mean, you, you have case studies. Uh, why did you choose this surah as a case study? So this is surah al-Masad, which begins, Perish the hands of Abu Lahab, and perish he, neither his wealth availed him, nor what he had earned. Soon he will enter the blazing fire, and his wife too, the firewood carrier, with a rope of palm fiber around her neck. Yeah, well, um, this was one of the, 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 even one of the first ones I wrote uh, in, in, in this series, and uh, I was I was fascinated first of all because it's it's one of the, it's 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 one of the few stories that seems to definitely refer to some historical event that happened in the time period of the writing. It's referring to somebody by name, uh, and there's a lot of hostility towards the person that drew me to it. Also, it was short, and I was just beginning my my process of studying these things, so that I thought it'd be a little bit more manageable. And, and I came upon uh, an issue that really is, becomes an issue for me with most of these surahs that I'm studying, which is what is the relationship between the surah and the interpretation that follows the surah? Uh, how much should the later interpretation or that's filling in some of these gaps uh, should I take into my interpretation of the text itself? Now, the gaps are, uh, first of all, who is Abu Lahab? I don't know who he is. What did he do? That, that made him uh, be punished like this, doesn't say. Uh, what does it mean that his wife is carrying wood? Not explained. What does it mean that his wife is wearing a collar of plated uh, palm leaves around her neck? Uh, it doesn't say. So all of these different questions, and almost all of them are, are, are later uh, uh, answered by people filling in the gaps. And I, I kind of see it's more like fan fiction that people are, writing stories about their favorite characters and filling in and making 
uh, because it, it doesn't even have a much, have much to do with the story itself. This is maybe an exception because it seems to be referring to an actual historical thing. Uh, they go to town. I mean, Abu Lahab is the uncle of uh, the prophet, and he and his wife did all of these things to uh, uh, hinder the prophet and make his life miserable. And there are all kinds of stories about that, all external to the surah, of course. And then uh, uh, Abu Lahab, his name means the father of flame. And some say that that you know that that's because of his fate burning in hell. Some people say it's because he's keeping the flame of uh, the, of Uzza. And his alternate name in these traditions is uh, Abdul Uzza, the, the slave of Uzza. Right. So they right. fill in all these different things, and uh, I, I, I tried first of all look at the story without all the all, all the, the baggage, and and it it, it becomes like a, a relatively simple uh, uh, sermon against uh, the dangers of wealth and depending on wealth, which it fits that way. But then when you bring in all this other stuff, it becomes much more interesting and and, and complex. And, and it, it just led me to a basic question, which is, uh, uh, what, what is the impulse that wishes uh, that, that an individual should be tortured like that, burned, burned eternally in hell? Uh, where does that impulse come from, and how, how, can, we, uh, how can we process that? Because it, I find that really a disturbing idea. And, and it seems to me the only way you could wish somebody that kind of uh, unrelenting pain is either because they've done something so absolutely horrible that, 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 that that's the only thing that would be appropriate. And I, I, I find it difficult to think what that would be. Or uh, you dehumanize them, you make them something less than, than human. So I'm actually protesting against the sentiment of the surah. And I, I come up with two different possibilities uh, of, of how to understand it. And, and one is a psychological one, that saying all these negative things is, is purgative. And I compare it to the imprecatory psalms, uh, the psalms that condemn their enemies. Uh, uh, Psalm 137, my favorite, where it says, uh, you know, blessed is the one who takes your little ones by the, by the toes and dashes their heads against the rock. I mean, how could anybody wish such a thing? So I, I think of it maybe as a purgative thing. You're not really going to do the thing, but you're, you're an oppressed minority. You're suffering, and this is a way to make yourself feel good. But then I move into a theological sense. And I and I, I argue that 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 this is an ugly sentiment. This is a sentiment that we have to uh, distance ourselves from, and and we have to reject and repudiate. And it's a sentiment that we see in religion all the time. Uh, you know, Christian nationalism, uh, the uh, just uh, enlisting religion uh, uh, for the cause of, of hatefulness and and, and violence. Uh, so so I, I protest against this sort of I. I respect what the source says. I listen to what the source says, and I says, and I say, I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to be identified with, 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 with the glee that somebody might feel at the, at the, at the torture and suffering and death of their enemy. So uh, I, I find this a very disturbing story for that reason. So to play, well, first of all, just one, one point you mentioned Al Oza. So just to say uh, and explain in the book, Abu Lahab was a nickname for. Uh, what was the the proper name of uh, Muhammad's uncle, according to the tradition, of course, yeah. which is Abd al Uzza and Uzza al Uzza is, um, I mean, appears in Quran fifty three, and anyway, in the epigraphic record, uh, this is uh, the Quran is reflecting um, what was an earlier cult for a goddess who is known as Al Uzza, and we so, have a chapter on that in my book too. <laughs> yes, so um, yeah, but then. Um, I mean, just to say that, uh, uh, I mean, so Islamic tradition would say Abu Lahab was the nemesis of the prophet. He was the prophet's uncle. And anyway, humans should have a certain disposition to recognize the oneness of God, the true God, uh, not associate anything with him. I mean, I'm just channeling what, what would uh -huh. be a sort of yeah a pious approach. Uh, but then even other readings, wouldn't they sort of suggest that, um, I mean, this, the nature of Surah 111 points to certain crimes of both Abu Lahab and, uh, and his wife. That is, I mean, in other words, it's not for nothing. I mean, the God of the Bible also is a God of vengeance and justice. And it's not for nothing that uh, the Quran seems to celebrate their, I mean, their, their torture in hell. Um, 
so uh yeah i mean what would you say to that i mean there there are sort of uh, uh, there's stories of uh the wife of abu lahab th throwing firewood in the path of of muhammad just to bully him and other stories which i think you mentioned in the book associate the the carrying of firewood as a sort of metaphor or circumlocution for gossip or something like that so yeah would you have a response to that yeah well First of all, I, I, the Hebrew Bible is, is much more violent than the Quran. Uh, you know, if you as, when you compare the parallel passages, it, it's really obvious. And uh, my students picked up on that, which really surprised me. I, I thought they'd be much more defensive, and they said, "I like this better." Uh, so I, 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 I'm, I'm not making a general characterization about the Quran here, because I think the Quran is much more characterized by. Uh, by 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 mercy and forgiveness uh, than, than than by judgment. I think that, I think the preference goes in that direction. Uh, and and what you, what you described to me is what I said is like you know if if you're going to want to wish this kind of suffering on an individual, then you have to find you have to figure out something yeah. really awful. Yeah, I see what that you they did. Yeah. So what what could be more awful than telling stories about? Uh, uh, about how, how these people did everything they could to keep the prophet from, yeah. from proclaiming yeah. his message. But and that's it, not actually in the text. I mean, I assume no, that's what you're going to say. It's not there yeah. in Surah 111. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm, I'm really, I, I mean, I, I look on, I look on the, uh, the, the, the occasions for revelation and the, and the, the, the biographies of the prophet and the, and the, the, the I see those as like the history of interpretation, just mm -hmm. like we, mm -hmm. we would see it. We would see in the Bible, the, uh, the, the writings of the rabbis and the midrash and the Talmud and the writings of the church fathers mm -hmm. uh, as, as now they, they they tell us something about the way the text was read at a particular historical moment yes. but frequently they don't tell us much about the text I, sometimes I, they I do, agree. but I, a lot of times they don't yeah. so I, I always take that with a grain of salt and yet there's there's a there's a there's so much lacking of detail and particularity in this passage uh, that it, it just it just begs for this, and I I don't think that's wrong. Some of my more recent research after the book, I've thought about that a little bit more deeply, and and I and I I, I see that as a positive thing. The the, the the silences in the Quran, well, each community in each successive generation has to fill those silences in different ways, and I see that as a positive thing. That's yes. that's one of the things that makes the text more universal and last you know over a long period of time. Yes. Uh, but the, the gaps are there. That's a really interesting point, right? That the, the the presence of the gaps allow people to participate in the production of meaning in conversation with the text. So absolutely. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so uh, before we finish, I would just like to give, um, give our viewers a chance to get to know you better and your sure. journey into Quranic studies. I mean, really intriguing because you taught many years uh, in the theology department at um, University of St. Thomas, uh, I, I assume mostly on Bible, Bible's literature, were those your, your main courses? Yeah, we, Did you have a favorite we also course had a general course. course. Okay. We had a general course that would start with the Old Testament and with Vatican II, which we all had to teach. Okay. But other than that, I was mostly teaching Hebrew Bible. And then at a certain point, I developed a course on the Bible and the Quran, which I taught a number of times. Terrific. And I'm still teaching. Great. Yeah. So uh, do you have a favorite book of the Bible? Uh, it would have to be Job, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I've worked on Job so many different times in so many different contexts, and uh, I, I, I really love the profundity of the book, and I, I enjoy working with it, and, and it never, it never ends. It's just, it just always yields new stuff, new insights. I should have anticipated that, not yeah, only because you mentioned Job earlier, uh, I, I assume in the context of the Satan figure there, but um, also you mentioned Job's friends uh, mm -hmm. in our conversation. Um, but also because it's a book which is just does not allow you to make a simplistic reading or you just <laughs> keeps you thinking. And that, that, that's the kind of things I look for. That's the kind of thing I like to work on. In the Bible, I didn't, uh, I've never written stuff on the legal material. Other people love that. But I, mm -hmm. I, I look for these narratives, these really complex, uh, uh, tension-filled narratives. And they're, they're the ones I have a lot of fun working with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and then... Um, Excuse me. Um, yeah, uh, could you just tell us generally? Maybe I'll just ask two or three questions, and I'll, I'll let let you go in peace. But uh, generally, um, uh, 
you know, how, what are the what are the main questions that interested you in biblical studies? Um, I'm just trying to find a way to get more of your engagement with the field of biblical studies. So maybe if you wanted to answer that question, or you could tell us about you know what's what's different or unique about the study of the Hebrew Bible um, that people who are maybe watching this that you know know mostly the Quran and Quranic studies should know. Um, yeah, could you maybe answer one of those two questions? Okay, well, let me just tell me if I'm if I'm on point here. But uh, what I, I I loved about the Hebrew Bible, there was a certain point in my career where I had to decide um, Hebrew Bible or New Testament. I, I my master's degree is actually in New Testament, and I picked the Hebrew Bible because it has all the good stories. <laughs> I just uh, I mean there I mean I, I not to disparage the New Testament, but it, it, there's so much more diversity and variety and interesting characters in the, in the Hebrew Bible. And I, 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 a thing that mo a lot of my Muslim uh, uh, interlocutors see as a flaw in the Hebrew Bible, I see as a, a strength, which mm -hmm. is the, uh, uh, the honest depictions of the flaws of the main characters. Yes. I, I, had a, I had a Muslim cleric who sat in a whole semester of my class on the Hebrew Bible, and he was with us the whole semester. It was wonderful to have in the class. When I got to the point in, in Genesis where Abraham is pimping his wife to the Pharaoh, he just stood up and said, this is impossible. This is impossible. Abraham is a Hanif. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a saintly. He would never do that. Again, the, the harmonizing impulse. Uh, but but that, to him, that was a flaw. To me, that's the strength of the Hebrew Bible is the, the honest portrayals of of, of these, these 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 towering figures, and yet we see so many things about them. I mean, I, I've seen big debates uh, between uh, Muslims about uh, you know, when when Moses kills the Egyptian. You know, uh, how could Moses do such a thing? And well, it, it's be, before he was a prophet, or he was you know he didn't mean to do it. They make all these different because they don't want their major figures to be to to, to be imperfect. I, I love the imperfection of the major figures in the Bible. So that would be one thing. I was at a, I heard a lecture once in Turkey, where uh, this the the speaker uh, m made the argument that the Quran uh, is a better source for history to work with than the Bible because the stories it tells about the prophets uh, protect their impeccability or yeah, um, so therefore we can use it as a historical source. Um, so and that's yeah. also used as an argument against using the Bible. Exactly. This is exactly. evidence of its corruption. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And then uh, at some point you, you got interested in the Quran. How did that, how did that take place? Okay. A, a few reasons. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, 2012, I, I finished a book on the, on wisdom literature, the Bible, kind of like a capstone of my career because I've been working on wisdom, you know, since graduate school, and I've always enjoyed it. So I, I just brought it all together in one book, and then I had to look for, you know, some other uh, mountain to climb. And uh, I had been learning Arabic in fits and drabs uh, ever since I married my wife. I, I, I did a whole Rosetta Stone. I took one semester uh, in, in a college course, a course at a community ed place, and many, many, many lessons with my wife. We learned we learned Arabic songs. We read Arabic fairy tales. And uh, I saw this as a very uh, kind of a, a useful way to move, to, to use my Arabic and to improve my Arabic. Uh, I, I'm not, these are not necessarily in order of importance. And then there's the whole idea that, that, that my, my wife and my wife's family, they're all Muslim. Uh, she was raised uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia with, you know, with a, a, a very heavy Islamic curriculum where she had to learn the Quran and fiqh and all that. And uh, and and many of my uh, many of my in-laws don't speak English. Uh, and when my wife gets together with her sisters and they, you know, chatter along in Arabic and I I would like to so I, I wanted to learn. For, I wanted to get access to the culture and the religion and the worldview of, of, of this, this this family that I've been grafted into. So that's another reason. Uh, the other the, another reason is just I, I want, once I started to look at it, I was intrigued by the uh, what I the Quranic challenge that they say, they say, you know, the way they say it in the Quran is, you know, could you write something this good? 
but I, I think what's implied in that is is if you if you look at the Quran, if you study it, uh, you will see its 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 divine quality. You you will see its its superior nature, its inimitability. And I I, I thought that was an interesting challenge. So you you, you know you read the Quran in, in translation, and you know you start at the beginning. It doesn't do anything, but you know, but if you learn in Arabic. So I, I, I wanted to accept that challenge. I wanted to learn, uh, you know, why is it that, that the, these two billion people just revere this book? I, I, I mean, I understand, I understand the, uh, the impact of the Bible. I wanted to see similarly uh, in the Quran. Uh, so uh, all those different reasons kind of coalesced and it just became just a, a great new thing to do. And it was like, uh, it was like going back to graduate school and I, I felt two things. First of all, it, it, it was it was it was a, it was fun and re enriching for me to, to to just move into this whole new conceptual world, the whole new vocabulary and and whole new styles of writing. Uh, it was it was it was interesting for me. It was it was something that 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 you know, kept me alive. And then the other thing um, is 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 that uh, is that I think I think what I learned by studying the Hebrew Bible. Uh, uh, some of those 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 skill sets are, are applicable to this other text, and I uh, I really believe that I have something unique to contribute mm -hmm. to the uh, first of all to the to the the academic Quranic community, and and boy, you, you folks have been tremendously uh, hospitable to me as an outsider. I mean, you know, I, I've read papers at your conferences and 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 learned so much from you. So that that's been terrific. Uh, but I also feel I have something to teach, something to offer mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because of my approach. And uh, and I, I'm very excited to be able to do that as a, as a, as a retired person. I, I don't have anything to prove anymore. You know, I, <laughs> I, my career has been established and I've, I, you know, I, I don't have to any tenure committees or any promotion committees. This is this is for the for the joy of learning, uh, for the for the desire to engage with this you know very vibrant academic community. And then finally, uh, I, I'm, it, it, it's giving me a tremendous opportunity uh, to, to, to engage with the Islamic community in, in, in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Mm. And I, I'm involved with a monthly uh, uh, Islamic Christian dialogue. Uh, I'm making a presentation this Sunday on the transmission of scripture. They always have a Christian speaker and a, and a Muslim speaker, and I do okay. that occasionally. Okay. And then there's a there's a national meeting that meets once a year that I usually participate in, and and my 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 background in the Quran has really helped me in terms of the, the dialogue. And then uh, last thing I'll say is that uh, I really do encounter God when I memorize and chant the Quran. I I I I, I it becomes a portal to the divine presence for me. Uh, and, and that's 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 a wonderful gift that that the Islamic community has given me is to be able to do that, and uh, and it, it's just it's just been uh, it's just been a, a wonderful enriching experience in the you know this final part of my career, and I'm I'm continuing with it. I I've I've written two more chapters or two more papers since uh, the book came out, and I'm working on a third one now, which I seem to have committed myself to read in. Uh, Pretoria, South Africa, this summer at the International SBL, oh, and I'll probably submit it to the ICSA in uh, November as well on uh, sort of on Noor. On Noor. Anyway, beautiful. that yeah. answers your question. So Thank all you so reasons. much for that reflection. Yeah, I think people will really, really appreciate that um, in its in its uh, complexity and in your particular your particular story and journey. It's really wonderful to hear. Um, yeah, some of the details that individuals uh, of the ind individuals' journeys, um, and to see how uh, you know th th their the particular chemistry of their life and circumstances has led to their approach to the text, and uh, in this case, their approach to the Quran. Uh, if people want to stay in touch with your work, or if you have a, f a future um, a future project publication, you alluded to some papers. Yeah, what should they know about that? Well, I, my, my technique is just to pick a text and immerse myself into it and then volunteer to read a paper on it at a conference. And I just do that until I get enough for a book and then maybe another 10 years I'll have another book. Okay. Uh, but 
I, I, I put all my papers on academia.edu, I think it is. And uh, yeah. so after I presented at a conference, I put it there. And so it would be accessible there. And uh, I'm always uh, I'm always interested in dialoguing with people if anybody wants to talk to me. Uh, I think my email address is there. I have a Facebook page. Uh, I I just I, I just love the engagement. I love the dialogue. I love talking to people about these things. Thank you, yeah, David. Thank you so much for this conversation. Really appreciate it. I hope it won't be the last time, and that we can continue the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and you're welcome. My pleasure. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the, um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll would be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.